Kia ora koutou everyone, ko Fiona McDonald Tukalingua, no Otatai Aho. Uh, I'm CE uh, for Education Outdoors New Zealand, so welcome um, to today's session. Uh, we'll get started. Um, we may have a few more people that I just let in as we go. Um, you would have heard the recording started uh, message. Um, hopefully that's okay with everyone. Uh, the session will be available to you afterwards later this week, and it also goes up on our website, um, so you can refer back to anything if you want to. I'll just start us with Karakia. Tutawa mai i rona, tutawa mai i raru, tutawa mai i rotu, tutawa mai i wahu. Kia tō ai, te modi tu, te modi ora ki tu. Katoa, omie, huie, tahikie. Uh, just a few housekeeping bits and pieces um, before we get started. Um, if you can just double check you're on mute um, so we don't get any kind of feedback or um, office discussions uh, happening during the meeting, that'd be great. Uh, and yeah. feel free to drop anything into the, tr the chat you have um, question-wise as we go through or pop your hand up. Um, sometimes it's a little bit hard for me to see um, hands coming up with so many people on, uh, but you're also free to um, come off mute and just ask. I'll try and pause a few times and make sure we have time at the end for questions as well. Uh, and if you could check uh, either at your school or in your neighbouring schools or clusters of schools uh, whether the EOTC uh, coordinators database is something that you're on. Um, that would be super helpful. Uh, we run that on behalf of the Ministry of Education and we're trying to get one coordinator from every school on board. It's free, takes a couple of minutes. If you're not sure whether your school is involved with that, uh, just jump on our website, register and we'll sort out any double ups. Uh, we often run into the circumstances where uh, the school has had an EOTC coordinator registered but they left and have gone somewhere else. So if you're not sure, if you're not getting emails um, from EONS, uh, yeah, jump on there and register. Uh, so today's session, uh, last time we looked at the toolkit, uh, the tools and forms to support EOTC. Uh, this time we're going to focus on the safety management plan template and work our way through the sections that are in that template, focusing mainly on things that we've added or strengthened. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing in here. Oh, one more slide first. And um, I'll pop over to the template in a, after this slide and work our way through that. Uh, so template is made up of two pieces and basically it's designed to fill the gap between the Ministry of Education EOTC guidelines and the toolkit of tools and forms you use for planning and delivering EOTC. Uh, it is reasonably recent. The first version of this template was developed in 2018. Um, so it might be a document that doesn't exist in this form in your school at the moment. Uh, some boards uh, like to have a separate EOTC policy. This document combines it in with the procedures. Uh, absolutely fine to have a separate one. Um, I would suggest that you do a little bit of a gap analysis between the front of this document and your current EOTC policy and just check uh, that they kind of align uh, as a good way forward. Right, just bear with me while I stop sharing that. And... Okay, so this is um, the web page that has all of the uh, toolkit and bits and pieces on it. Uh, it sits under 
POTC management when you pop onto our website. And this is the National Coordinator Database tab at the very top, if you need to find that. Uh, so on the page, uh, there's some information about making a copy for the of the templates. There's a, a guide that we've put together that gives a bit of an explanation about each part, uh, the tools and the safety management plan. There is the plan that we're going to go into in a minute. The uh, templates for all of the toolkit, plus a completed example for all of the tools, and then the new EOTC coordinator uh, toolkit down the bottom. Uh, we haven't got a filled in example of the EOTC coordinator tools yet, um, but that's on the list. So if we drop over to the EOTC safety management plan, uh, first point to make here uh, is that this is a one-size-fits-all document. Uh, there's one template for the smallest, tiniest primary school uh, with one classroom in rural Southland, all the way up to the biggest city high school in Auckland. Uh, so you absolutely have to edit it. Uh, and if you're using school docs, lots of the information in here is actually embedded on your school docs site. Um, but it's really important that you make sure what is in that site matches what you actually do in school. Uh, we haven't numbered or put numbers into this template, uh, really because we recognise that uh, schools are all going to edit it and you'll end up with your own kind of system that makes the most sense to you. Um, as it sits in Google Docs, it's really easy to navigate because you can just click on uh, these bits over on the side to find uh, where you want to go. Once you've edited it, if you want numbers, just add them in. Uh, oh, and very quickly, uh, you don't have to request editing access. Uh, you just go to file, make a copy if you want it as a Google Doc, or download it if you want it as Word or any of those other formats. So hopefully super easy to get a hold of in the format that you want, and that should make it far more editable and user-friendly. So some key points. Your editing starts right away when you describe yourself and what EOTC looks like um, at your place. And an explanation of your safety management system, okay, how the whole thing kind of fits and works together in the overarching school health and safety system. Also, uh, we've tried to tie in the school-wide health and safety goal and some planning that you might do around EOTC and your improvement, so the maintenance and improvement of your system. Um, and that's a requirement that comes straight out of health and safety legislation, so important to pay attention to. And we've put some blue writing in here to kind of give you some guidance about what good practice looks like in this space. Um, but again, you need to edit that uh, so it is what you actually do and what you can achieve. The next section uh, is the same as last time, uh, outlines roles and responsibilities. Uh, these responsible or the bullet point responsibilities uh, pretty much come straight out of the EOTC or the Ministry of Education EOTC guidelines, um, slightly combined and edited. Uh, and the key point down here um, is that we've added in uh, principal as a management role compared with principal where they sit up and the board as a governance role and split those two out. And where most schools will do a bit of editing is around this EOTC coordinator space uh, where uh, it's often, particularly in high schools, split with the senior leader that has EOTC responsibility. So uh, some of the principal's management responsibilities some of the EOTC coordinator's responsibilities probably sit uh, for in high, in high school space in the senior leader with EOTC uh, management responsibility space. So um, do some editing there, put the responsibilities um, under the role that they belong with. Uh, one of the major changes into um, 
all of these responsibilities is really highlighting uh, the responsibility to ensure the inclusion of all students in EOTC and that that is carefully planned for. Um, so that will come out of the Ministry of Education EOTC guidelines when they are reviewed and updated, um, hopefully out to schools sometime early next year. Any questions around that first bit of roles and responsibilities, um, the maintenance review of your system? Oh. Just pop anything in chat or uh, take yourself off mute. Uh, so uh, the, the next major section in here is around your event procedures. And this section, the whole rest of the document really describes how EOTC happens in your school. And this is where it's super important that you edit it to make sure it reflects the reality uh, for your school. Uh, there are some green boxes through here just to kind of give a little bit of explanation. And once uh, you have edited it, uh, you can uh, delete those green boxes. So this table here kind of gives an outline of the steps that uh, you would go through when planning and running EOTC and all of the sort of bits that you would consider. And pretty much all of these bullet points have an explanation in more detail further down in the document. A major change uh, here is the event category table where we have um, combined medium to high risk into one column. Now we've done this because when we think about uh, the level of approval, um, the consent and caregiver information in the planning, the things that are required for medium to high risk, medium or high risk, I should say, um, are pretty much the same. It's just the level of detail that changes as the level of risk gets higher and the complexity of the event is more. Uh, you might choose um, to split those out and have four columns entirely up to you. Uh, one thing that is really important to do is go through in these with the, where the blue writing is and put in the examples of what type of trips fit in each of those categories for you. And we've put some ones, su suggestions in there, but real examples for your school, uh, is a very good idea. And where you might have differences from what is here also is in the who's giving approval. So going through and making sure uh, that the right uh, role is in there for who's giving approval. Uh, in medium to high risk, this would often be um, in a high school that senior leader with the OTC responsibility, not the principal. And whether or not uh, you have the board involved in giving approval at any stage, of course, is a board and school decision. Uh, there's no requirement, a legal requirement for the board um, to give approval in any of these stages. Uh, of course, they should absolutely um, be getting information on the types of events that are happening um, and when overnights are, um, but they don't necessarily need to give approval for those. Um, they need to ensure that that responsibility is correctly delegated if they have delegated it to the principal. And if the principal delegates it on, that that person is appropriate and competent um, for that role. Uh, the exception to board approval is uh, for overseas trips, but that's linked to um, financial requirements rather than health and safety ones. Uh, one thing that's really good to do with this table is once you've kind of worked out how it works uh, for EOTC in your school is to create a workflow or a flow chart from it um, so that staff can clearly see uh, what you expect as far as this planning information down the bottom. Um, and once you've created your flow charts or your workflows, uh, we'd love to see some examples. 
Um, every school seems to create a different one. Uh, so we would really appreciate seeing someone in them, particularly if you're willing to share and we can add that um, to our completed examples. Uh, I can see there's a couple of questions in the chat, so I'll just take a pause and answer those. Uh, Robin, um, seeing what's changed uh, rather than completing side by side, uh, no. Um, we There was so many changes that it really um, wasn't practical to have a tracked changes copy. Um, it just became completely overwhelming. Um, pretty much every sentence has had some change in it. Uh, there's major changes and minor changes, but um, this and all of the tools as well have had uh, yeah, a vast number of changes um, to reflect modern wording, uh, boards of trustees to school boards, etc. So yeah, it's it's pretty extensive amount of change. Yeah, Ian, um, so school docs have taken um, this document and embedded it, or embedded most of it in the site. So um, you can have a look at this um, and pop it beside your school doc site um, and then think about what it, EOTC looks like in your school and make sure that those things match. Uh, some schools, I, some docs, school docs, schools I know um, are choosing to use uh, this as a separate document that then gets uploaded to school docs. Uh, so again, um, every school is a little bit different and the choice is up to you. But we have um, and continue to work with school docs in their EOTC um, review. And so they have and have been involved in the process of developing this. We've seen their feedback. Um, and use that in the process. Uh, so looking at the starting to prepare and plan um, and the risk management planning, uh, we've just tidied this up. That was a terrible table before. And there's a large note here that tries to hopefully explain uh, where you might use a risk assessment and supervision form as compared to using standard operating procedures. Um, I have done a Zoom on creating standard operating procedures that sits on our website that you can go back and watch, um, and we might do another one um, later in the year as well, uh, because it's something we're really trying to um, encourage schools to do for those low risk uh, activities that occur all of the time standard operating procedures are much simpler once you develop them for staff to use and uh, I think it's it's a good process to go through for those lower risk activities or activities that are happening all of the time. Uh, looking into the risk assessment matrix, uh, slight change here um, one of these categories has now gone to extreme and then there's an extra high in here. Um, we would encourage you um, to think really carefully if you're identifying um, these areas, um, extreme and high, when you're planning events, um, that you consider where or how else you could achieve those learning objectives in a lower risk environment. The key here is that this is not an absolute science. Uh, you'll find uh, hundreds of different risk matrix uh, out there, um, all sorts of different industries, but it's really a thought process to get you thinking and to help you try and identify which are the most important controls to focus on. What's the things that are really gonna hurt kids if we get them wrong and don't pay attention to that particular control? Any other questions at the moment? I can't see anything else in chat. Oh. Around staff competency and supervision, uh, we're really trying to focus people in on looking first 
at the competencies that the activity requires. So leaving staff aside, what competencies do your EOTC activities that you're intending to deliver require? And then looking at the staff that you have down for running those activities. And the key question then is, do those two things match? Really good to keep records uh, that help support that decision-making about competency. And we've added a couple of forms into the new EOTC coordinator toolkit to support that idea of thinking about what competency the activity requires and recording that and then recording the competency that your staff have, their experience and skills, and then matching those two together. Uh, we've added a section down in here around parents in charge of EOTC events where there's no school staff attending. It's one of the questions I get most of the time. It's particularly common in sports like equestrian, motocross, downhill mountain biking, where there might just be one or two Akonga students going on that event with their parents towing their horse behind them. Uh, so what we've talked about in here is that you need to have that really robust discussion with those parents. And the key concept is that there's no surprises. So the parents know exactly uh, what checking the school has done around health and safety and the risk management of that event and the school's role in it. Um, and that's what they're signing up to. Uh, we've strengthened the section on engaging external providers. Um, and one of the vital things in here and a requirement of the Health and Safety at Work Act is for the school and the provider to share and understand their responsibilities. And that comes straight out of the legislation. You need to be talking to each other. You need to have an agreement on who's doing what. And particularly from the school's point of view, around emergency procedures. So what happens if you have the worst case scenario? Uh, who's responsible for uh, the first aid? Who's responsible for calling the parents? Those things need to be clear beforehand. Uh, and think also that it's your students, but it's also your staff going into that situation. Uh, there's a form that supports that, that the external providers agreement form but providers also have their own documentation and contracts and those sorts of things so um, that might be perfectly adequate uh, to meet that need um, and it could just be as simple as recording your conversation in agreement via an email um, but it's you need to have something in there We've added a section on external contractors as opposed to external providers. So external contractors, where they come in and they are basically um, working under your, or they are working under your school safety management system. And the easiest way to think about them is that they just become like a staff member. Um, but it is really key for those people uh, where that you have, a, where you're paying them, um, you have a contract with them and they know their responsibilities. There's some induction and they know they have some rights to say no if they're feeling unsafe. So that's added in there as well. A uh, little bit of clarification around um, consent to assess, uh, sorry, consent um, with parents and informed consent. Uh, and this has been highlighted out of Fakari White Island and some of the outcomes um, from all of those inquiries. The real need to make sure that we're disclosing the risks so that people can uh, make informed decisions and when they give consent, it is actually based on a realistic understanding of the event and the risks involved. So that's just outlined a wee bit clearer in there and particularly um, pulling out um, the need to get individual consent for swimming or water-based activities. Important. Um, please make sure that this se section, um, along with all the rest, but this section in particular, uh, either in the document or on school um, 
docs matches what you actually do. Okay, super important that uh, your policy and procedure says the same as reality in your school. A little bit in here on donations and the link through for information if you need that or have any parental questions around that. Uh, added a couple of things around first aid. Uh, so recommending that as part of your risk assessment, you decide whether you uh, take an EpiPen on in your first aid kit for first time anaphylactic reactions. And in your risk assessment, you would look at what's the, the likelihood of that occurring. So if you're going down here, it's going into the beech forest um, in summer with high wasp numbers. Uh, that would be a classic situation where your risk assessment would identify that it's a good idea to get an EpiPen. And there's some information in here about how to do that. Um, the second part in here is around AED locations or whether you have a, like, an AED with you. Uh, so part of your risk management planning, I just have a look and see where the closest one is and consider the risk of the people you are, have with you and the activity. Um, so water-based activities, uh, you might consider an AED um, or at least knowing where it is. Um, that's a link and there's a link in there to the app, which is super great to have on um, all of your phones. Uh, under transport, um, we've added a few bits and pieces in here, but the main concept here is adding in a recommendation that Arkonga don't tra transport other Arkonga. Um, and if they are going to be able to do that uh, for EOTC or for sport that happens within the school time, for, uh, within the school day, uh, that you need to have a clear procedure and again, that there's no surprises for parents. So the parents need to know and agree that their child has been driven by another student. And yeah, just making sure that this transport part, um, which is often um, tricky with sport as well, matches what happens in your school. We've added uh, the concept of operational limits, and this also occurs over in the standard operating procedures. And that's where uh, the either the weather is or the something else dynamic in the environment, some limit that you can set um, well ahead of the activity. Uh, so swell heights, uh, weather warnings, uh, Temperature is another one that you might consider um, in this operational limits. And it can just, setting them early can just make decision making um, easier on the day or in the days leading up um, to the event. And takes out some of the, oh, it might be okay. Um, if you're in a, in a red zone, you just know that it's not going to happen. And you've already set your contingencies to deal with that. Uh, in the emergency planning section, um, this is about making sure that uh, you're well planned ahead of time uh, and your staffing and your staffing competency uh, can cope with emergency situations. Um, we often plan for just business as usual, but really when we're planning for EOTC, uh, we need to be planning for that emergency situation and ensuring that uh, whatever that EOTC plan looks like, it's aligned with your wider crisis response. Uh, and particularly uh, around uh, lockdowns at school, when you've got trips out, and those trips need to know what happens if there's a lockdown at school. And also um, some careful consideration about how you might deal with uh, cell phone use and social media use by students. And that differs uh, across schools vastly. 
um, but having some pre-thought about it and a plan uh, really makes a difference. And that was particularly highlighted from um, the mosque shooting situation down here where some schools had uh, really solid cell phone use plans and others didn't and there was some uh, very diverse uh, results from that. So there's just in these parts there's just some good um, bullet points to work through as you go ahead and plan and then implement. Uh, on the day, we're really trying to highlight that throughout the whole event, you're managing risk, assessing, managing, looking at your, the effectiveness of your controls during the activity, and that's a real continual and ongoing process. Um, it's not just a piece of paper that has to be done and handed in six weeks ahead of time um, or the day before, um, that that process is uh, brought to life and really dynamic on the day and throughout the activity. And alongside that, that this really good ongoing communication um, with everyone during the activity. We've just cleaned up the, the way the incident reporting piece looks and added in, uh, taken out a, an old um, system of identifying how serious incidences are and just popped a link in here that gives you really good guidance if you need to notify to work safe. So that's good to go into if you end up with an incident that requires hospitalization and basically it will, uh, the work safe process will guide you through whether you need to notify them or not. Uh, we've added a wee bit more detail into the review and evaluation and I guess the main point here is uh, to think about review and evaluation in terms of the complexity of the event. So for simple low risk events that are happening all the time, might just be three questions on a Google form or a Microsoft form. You know, did you meet your objectives? What would you do again? What would you change for next time? And that's all about ensuring that lessons are learnt and passed on, and particularly if that teacher goes and someone else picks up running that trip the next year. And you don't want to make the same mistake again or do it in a less than ideal way again and again. So really like a nice simple evaluation form. The template evaluation form is for a more complex major kind of camp type event. So you can take pieces out of it um, for those more simple events. This piece um, used to be at the front, but it's, it's great to keep an eye on the history of the document. Um, super easy now with, uh, you know, online, um, Google, Microsoft, uh, if you're creating and storing documents online, um, super easy to track history. Uh, and we've added the supporting document piece as well. So you can uh, just create links into uh, relevant um, policies within the school. So you're not doubling up at all. Uh, this gives you a list of uh, legislation, guidelines, good practice uh, in there that you can keep an eye on and are relevant to this document and then some supporting organisations as well. Uh, and you can add uh, to this list as you go. And it's a good way of kind of keeping all the links and the information and the things that the EOTC coordinator and the senior leader with the EOTC responsibility um, should have an eye on, kind of in one place as well. And down the side, you can just comment when you last looked at them to keep up to date. Right, have we got any questions coming through? 
very quiet today. Um, kia ora, Fiona. I just had a quick question about external contractors. Um, is it, could an example be, say, you're getting someone in to run a self-defence class for an hour with um, year sevens? Is that kind of what you mean? Or is it, yeah. um, or is it more to do along the lines you're um, contracting an external provider, like, say, I know we've had um, people that come on school to, they've set up climbing frames and climbing walls and they've kind of done that. So what, are we looking at everyone that comes on to provide a service that we'd run through that, or is it specific? Kind so, of? Um, so both of your examples um, would be uh, EOTC providers, um, because I presume the uh, one providing self-defense is kind of working under their own systems rather than your systems. Um, so that'd be an external provider. And for something as simple as that, it might just be um, an email uh, you know, around what they need uh, have you got first aid? We've got first aid. Uh, we'll have a teacher there the whole time. Can just be as simple as that. We'll look after any um, behavioural management. Yep. Um, for your climbing frame one, um, you might want to ask a few more questions around um, how they're going to manage uh, the climbing frame and the safety around how that's set up. Um, you might want to see whether they're registered as a uh, um, activity, uh, venture activity provider um, as well uh, for some of those ones where they're getting a little bit more adventurous uh, and possibly for some of those ones like go-karts and those sorts of things and um, if you're doing things with them they'll have um, they'll have a compliance that they have to do under uh, the entertainment devices so you can just kind of ask them a few questions about their safety um, to get an idea. And the uh, Form 6 guides you through some of those things that you might like to discuss with them. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question, Fiona. Um, you mentioned earlier you said um, think carefully around high and extreme events um, and avoid them. I think you said, I think I wrote it down right, avoid them where possible. And to think about what has potential to really hurt kids. So every year we offer a snow squad. And every week when the kids go to snow squad, I kind of sit and hope nothing goes wrong. Um, is that one of those events where schools so, are starting to not consider doing them because the risk is too high? Uh, so it's more, well, if you think of your snow example, um, if you were thinking high school and an outdoor ed winter snow trip, and you had a choice to do your uh, snow skills on a, a ski field that was avalanche controlled by someone else compared to um, going up an avalanche prone valley. Um, you're achieving the same outcomes, but one of them is a much riskier environment than the other one. So just really thinking about um, what your learning objectives are and where you can achieve those. And is there a way that you can decrease the risk of that environment. Um, another one might be uh, rips and surf beaches. Um, if you're going to do an activity that uh, doesn't demand big surf, uh, you, know, you, you could choose a non-surf beach that's likely to not have a rip um, for that activity compared with the riskier environment of going to a big surf beach with a big rip yeah I guess with for our snow squad like we have five-year-olds every five-year-olds up to 12-year-olds going yep it is, it's at it's at whakapapa and you know they've got the laha control and everything but I mean accidents happen like we have the odd break we yep. have the odd graze so you're saying we can still do that as long as we are just absolutely careful. So set up your systems and have those conversations with Whakapapa about how they are um, going to manage your five-year-olds compared with your year eights that are you know, off uh, going down all of the lifts. So it's that conversation between the provider and the school to ensure that it's well managed. And you know it's quite different uh, on a ski field where they have responsibilities for managing that environment compared to, you know, if you were taking them off back country. 
Okay. I have a, I have a second yes. other two questions. So we do kayaking as well in terms one and four. And we have a lady, just like a local lady that, like I go with the kids, we take eight senior kids and she isn't a registered anything. She's just a, a older lady who used to do kayaking. So she's not an external person. So does that mean the responsibility would all be under the school, even though she leads it and I kind of just assist? Yeah. Um, so sh sh does she come as a volunteer? Yep, we don't pay her. She volunteers and she used to years ago, I think, work in a school or did outdoor education or I don't know, but she has no... Yeah, so she she would be considered as working under your school system. So okay, so we so we do. I mean, we do do the rams anyway, but that's all fine as long as I'm happy with the risks and with the the ratios and everything. We can still run that. You need to be confident as a school that you have the systems in place to manage um, that particular activity. So. Um, you need to make some judgments on the competencies that that activity requires and then make sure you, in this case, you volunteer um, and you together as the supervision team have the competencies to cover that. And that's where you'd also look at uh, the location and the type of water you're going kayaking in. Okay. Yeah. Yep, and, yep. That, and really have a nice controlled environment um, that allows kids to uh, fail you know, fall out of their kayaks uh, without putting themselves in danger. Yeah, and just, so that's another good example. You can uh, go kayaking in two different places. One of them, if you fall out, you go over the rabbit rapid into the weir uh, or into the hole. Uh, and the second one, if you fall out, you drift down into the nice big pool. Yeah. yeah. So you know, those, that environmental thing is really key to consider. Yeah, we're on Lake Taupo. And my last question, yeah. you talked a bit about swimming earlier and like that a, a blanket consent covers, my, you know, day trips. I've had a couple of incidents where teachers have gone on a day trip and we've just done it under the blanket consent and then they've just let kids, the kids have come back wet and they've gone, oh, we've just let them have a swim in the lake. And I'm like, oh, no, we need to let parents know. So yeah. you were saying before that whenever swimming is involved, parents yeah. have to be informed don't they yeah when that's a change we've made um we pulled uh aquatic competencies or swimming out of the blanket consent form and have said that it needs to be a separate um form uh and i have no problem if with that. you look at the last uh uh 20 years 23 years of fatalities um in outdoor education all but two i think are related to water um, so it's a space we need to pay attention to. Um, we need, even if you think, and it's classic in sport, often they'll go, you go away on tournament and they'll get a bye and so they'll go down to the beach for a swim. It's not planned for. Um, so even if it's, maybe we'll go swimming during this activity, make sure it's planned for and make sure that your staff are competent. Okay, so that you're looking at the competencies um, that that activity requires and your staff are competent or your volunteers. So it's the same as your kayaking woman. You need to be sure that she's competent in that environment with those students. So awesome. thank you. Out of her mind for taking up time. Thank you. <laughs> Absolute pleasure. Anyone else? You can be guaranteed that other people had the same questions. Ah, Peter, yes. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Peter. You need to make sure um, if she's not qualified, because a qualification is one way of judging competency. Uh, and it sounds like she might have had one of those in the past, but doesn't now. Um, so, yeah, if she doesn't hold a qualification, you need to make sure you're comfortable that she's competent to run that activity in that place. Yeah, we're just on Lake Taupo and we only go when it's really calm. So we're not in any waves or rapids or rivers or... And also um, the type of boat you're using um, feeds into that. Like if you're on a sit on top, it's quite different to if you're in a boat that um, students have to have the competency to get themselves out of, or if you're using a spray deck, um, all of these things kind of feed in, which is why we don't talk about ratios anymore and why we talk about supervision structures, because there's all of these components to what appropriate competent supervision is. 
And it's really, really easy if we talk about ratios to just go, well, I've got one to four, or I've got one to 10, we're right. Um, but it just uh, takes away from the kids that you've got with you, the environment that you go into with, and this competency of your staff. Good questions. Uh, Sarah? Hey, Fiona. Um, just one question about uh, transport. With um, Usually we take buses, but sometimes if we've, we've got smaller groups, we'll use parents to help transport. Um, thoughts around um, kids in the front seat? Uh, yes. Um, we have put some recommendations into here uh, around... Uh, when it is appropriate or not. Um, ideally, uh, I think 14 and under, um, they kind of like to keep them out of the front seat if you can, uh, particularly um, younger primary school kids with airbags. Uh, and where did we put it in? Oh, actually it's not in here. It's in the, um, the transport forms. Uh, and it is also in, there's some really good information in the driving good practice guidelines. Awesome, but, great, because we had a look on the police website when, because, um, you know, when you've got that um, situation when you've got eight kids and then suddenly if you've, um, you know, between two parents and three parents and sometimes trying to get parent help is really tricky. Yeah. Um, so we had a look on the police website and we couldn't find anything that specifically said anything. Yeah, so pop into the good practice guides for driving. That's um pulled a whole lot of information together from different places um, and the other kind of way to do it is um, if that parent is driving their student yep. um, and they're happy with them in the front seat um, and, and then going back to the no surprises um, principle for those kind of the kids in the grey area not the ones that in car seats or little and can't go in the front but in those other ones where probably their parents would stick them in the front um, would pay to ask. Okay, no, that's great. Thank you. Anything else? I'll just pop back to slideshow. Uh, so just finishing off, a um, couple of wee points about kind of what to do next. Uh, I'd suggest if you can find two screens, um, download this new uh, safety management plan and put it beside the one you have now if you, if you have one um, and consider the changes or gaps that you might find. Um, cut and paste back and forth. Um, sometimes um, it is better just to start afresh. Um, get a little team around you and do go through that editing process so it works for your school. Um, get rid of the green boxes, okay, and, and make it um, useful. Uh, a lot of the, the sections in the event procedures part are written as uh, considerations. Um, so you might, well, you do really need to go through those and change the kind of wording so it is how your school wants it. And it's the reality um, for your school. And if you're on school docs, same process, I would suggest. Uh, just thought I'd mention the next Zoom because uh, that question has come up today. Uh, 7th of November, uh, talk about um, that competency decision-making. So. Um, both how you decide what competencies and activity it takes to run safely and then uh, tracking for your staff and how you make those decisions about do, do your staff that you've got down to run that activity have the experience um, they should have to safely run that activity. Uh, you can register for that um, off the EOTC management page um, where you'll find this recording as well uh, and a reminder about the good practice guides as well they sit on our or the link to those sit on our website uh, really useful that driving one is very good because it pulls information together from all sorts of different places uh, and so it's super useful to use 
um, and all of these different activity ones as well. Um, because they have, there's two parts to them and the planning template has a really wide range of the harms and hazards and the management controls already identified for you. And you can just, um, again, cut and paste, edit those to make them match how you're running that activity and where you're running it. Um, so chance for any last questions? Oh, here's one. Okay, could you explain a good example of the supervision structure blurb you would like to hear from an external provider for snorkeling? Oh, good so, um, yeah, just there, Fiona, I was, um, yeah, just from, I'm from the other side as the external provider that works uh -huh. with schools, so just listening in today. Yes. Um, uh, but uh, just, just, do you, so you would like to see, uh, just, we're going to be adding, adding the supervision structure for the activity in our part A of our RAF for yep. the site. Um, and so it might be, say, for Goat Island, it could be that we'd be expecting that we would have, um, you know, the maximum amount in the water, that there'd be two instructors, would, you know, would need maybe five five supervisors, competent supervisors from the school. Is yeah. that kind of what you're meaning for the supervision structure? Yeah, um, and and I guess what would be really useful for the school is to highlight the what the competencies of the school staff that you require or the volunteers that they bring with them actually are, um, you know, above being just breathing humans. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. you know, a, a competent to swim 200 metres. Yeah. Uh, snorkeling experience, for example, if we're going to be utilising the parents, there's that, um, and that we'll have an expectation that we will be assessing those parents in shallow water as well before we head out. Excellent. Yeah. That kind so of stuff. Highlighting all of that to the school, um, yeah. So when they're looking at the, super, the volunteers they've got, they're um, making mindful decisions about who they're bringing to you. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, if you have a look at Form 6, I think that could really help kind of guide the information from your point of view as well um, that you might be discussing with the school. The, the clearer the responsibilities uh, and that, that the provider agreement? can be. Sorry, what was that? Is that the provider agreement for me? Yes. Yeah, provider yeah. agreement. Yeah, already taken on board. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, cool. the, vol the volunteer form might be good for you to look at as well, and the swimming competency one, because that we've changed the competencies that we're asked, well, that we're suggesting schools ask their parents about. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, so they could they could be useful for you. Any last questions, team? Uh, my email, that eotc support at eons.org.nz, comes to me. Um, sometimes I will send that off to um, one of our facilitation team, but either me or one of those uh, lovely facilitators that some of you will have met along the way. Uh, we'll get back to you with your questions. I'm really happy to help um, at any stage. Uh, our EOTC safety management series of professional developments uh, has finished for this year, but um, make sure you're on the EOTC coordinator by database and you'll get that information about when they come up again next year. Uh, yeah, absolutely happy to help out at any stage. All right, uh, I just thought I'd finish with uh, this whakatoki um, and, you know, bring it together that uh, sometimes these forms and paperwork for EOTC um, look overwhelming, um, but, and are overwhelming for your staff. Um, we completely recognise that. We're trying to work on all the time on keeping them uh, and striking the balance between keeping them simple and usable um, and also meeting the needs of keeping students safe and uh, the regulations that come down out of legislation. So fine balancing act, um, but really trying to work on keeping 
students uh, safe and having quality EOTC and uh, having the most appropriate and helpful planning tools for your staff as well. So, fabulous people. I'll let you go. Three minutes back in your afternoons. Time for a, a cup of tea. <laughs> right. Ka kite, everyone.